the deepest pain that I've ever had in my life has probably been relational pain. It's probably true for you as well, that, that there's a lot of pain that we all experience in life. But there's something about relational pain that, that, that just stings particularly deeply. And, and, and I know that I've been hurt deeply in the past, and I know that I've hurt other people deeply in the past. And the reality is that I think some of us um, um, today, I'm sure we'll be experiencing uh, relational pain in this moment. And, and, and sometimes, yes, relationships do just fall apart, uh, you know, and, and, and no one's saying anything and no one's doing anything, but the relationship just seems to drift, it just seems to dissipate, it just seems to fall apart. But, but, but there are times when relationships uh, fall apart because, because someone's hurt us. And, and, and they hurt us in such a way that it feels like it would be impossible to ever rebound from that situation. And my guess is that whether we're online or whether we're in the building, in the life of this church, that there are loads of us who struggle with this kind of hurt. M maybe you had a friend who, who, who made a promise to you and they broke that promise. Maybe you you shared something with somebody and and, and uh, you did it in trust and you thought that they would never repeat it, but that, that they turned around and because they couldn't help themselves, that they, they just told a bunch of people. Maybe you grew up and there was somebody who was entrusted with your care, that they were there to care for you, but but instead of caring for you, they, they hurt you in an unimaginable way, and maybe they abused you emotionally, physically, sexually, I don't know. But maybe that the one person who was required to care for you abandoned you and, and left you with this void in your life. And, and if you live long enough, the bottom line is, you're going to get hurt. We're all going to get hurt. You know, we're, we're, we're all going to be betrayed by somebody who we thought we could trust. And the crippling reality of this is if you do something, if, if you don't do something with that hurt, if you don't do something with that betrayal, it will assault you every time, every single time it comes into your mind. I was talking to somebody a little while ago who, who, who are, uh, are now in their mid 40s, but when they were young, um, you know, um, their, 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 their father left them, tragically. And, and, and in many ways, relationally, he's unable to have a healthy relationship with another individual at certain levels because he still allows that hurt to assault him every single time it comes to mind. And I think that's where some of us are at, many of us are at perhaps. Something happened. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, five years ago, and you just can't get out of that. And for some of us, we have convinced ourselves that we can, we've convinced ourselves that we can manage the pain, that we can manage the hurt without ever offering forgiveness to that other person. In fact, some of us, and I think this guy that I was just talking about, uh, you know, um, it, it's quite like this, you know, it, he can hardly remember what it was that his father did to him. But unfortunately, the pain that we dare not remember is often the most dangerous pain of all. And they hurt, uh, and they hurt us so deeply that we, 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 we try to bury that pain, we try and bury that, that hurt, and we try to stuff them deep down into our, our past. But, 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 but it, it always comes back, usually disguised. It will always come back. And that's why the choice that I'm talking about today is so important. And I'm not going to try and manipulate anybody. But the reality is that over the next few moments, there, I think there is a lot at stake for some of us, actually. You know, we really have the choice being offered to us between life and death, between freedom and imprisonment, you know, as far as it goes with the state of our hearts. And so the choice that we're talking about today is really the choice to free people rather than hurt people. And you've heard this phrase, I've heard this phrase a lot over the years, you know, hurt people, hurt people. Uh, um, and it's true, 
hurt people do hurt people. You know, I, I've, I, I, I've seen that. I've experienced it. I've done that. You know, I've been hurt in my life in the past and I've taken that hurt from the past and I've hurt somebody with that hurt. Hurt people hurt people. But what is equally true, and I think we need to embrace this, uh, especially as a church, is that as true as the statement is that hurt people hurt people, it is also true that free people free people. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then you have experienced the most amazing freedom that anybody could ever experience. And Jesus one time told a story, and, and this is really important because I think I, I, what I think happens to a lot of us when we've been hurt, or at least it's true for a lot of people that I seem to meet with, is generally, generally we spend the vast majority of our time talking about why we feel justified in our anger and our hurt that we feel towards um, another person. And, and I, I recognise that's pretty normal. And I, I genuinely think that's where some of us are at. In fact, you know, as soon as you could tell where this message was going, where this topic of forgiveness was going, you're probably beginning to justify in your mind why it's okay um, for you to be angry with the other person that you're angry with, why it's okay for you to not offer that other person forgiveness. And that's why I want to set, but what I want to set up in this message is to say sometimes you don't forgive somebody for their sake. Sometimes you forgive somebody for your own freedom. You know, because you don't, you don't have freedom if you feel the way that you feel. With all that bitterness and all that hatred and all that anger wrapped up inside of you. So here's, here's what a lot of us don't understand. Bitterness never isolates itself to the source of the bitterness. You know, what a lot of us think, what a lot of people think, I think, is that, you know, that that other person hurt me, so, so I'm going to be angry and, and I'm going to hold resentment against that person. But, 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 but I'm going to be able to go through the rest of my life having healthy relationships with other people. You know, I, 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 and, and people think they can isolate the bitterness and the anger and the unforgiveness to this one particular relationship. But it never, ever works that way. That's not the way. You know, the bitterness you know, that, that comes along with unforgiveness works eventually it contaminates everything. It contaminates all our relationships. And it spreads sort of far and wide and deep and it impacts everything and everyone that you love, which again is why sometimes I need to say you don't forgive someone for their sake. You, you forgive someone for your sake, for your own freedom. And, and Jesus talks about this. Uh, in, in a great story in, in Matthew, and, and I, I'm just going to read the story to you, really. And, and you know, Jesus gets right to, th to the heart of what's at stake here and, and why it is, as free people, we should free other people. So in Matthew 18, here's what he says, verse 24. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, 10,000 talents is a lot of money, okay? One talent would be equal to about um, 16 years worth of wages. So if the maths is correct, we're talking about 160,000 years worth of wages here that this servant owes the master. So it goes on. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. You know, why his wife? Why his family? Why his children? You know, you know again, that this servant could never repay the debt. He can't pay a tenth of 1% of what it is that he owes. A servant in that day and age would have been worth around 1,500 sort of um, pounds. So it's not even touching this mountain of debt that he has. So it says the servant fell on his knees before him because he realises in this moment what's at stake. Be patient with me, he begged and I will pay back everything. And, this, and the servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. Now, just think about this for a second. Think about the utter humiliation, the utter embarrassment that this servant must be feeling. You know, he's going to be thrown into prison. He's going to be a slave for the rest of his life. And not just him. You know, the, the embarrassment comes because 
the debt that he's racked up is now going to impact his wife and family, his children. It's going to impact generations of children. It's going to impact his children's children, you know, generation after generation. 160,000 years of wages is a massive, massive debt. It's one that he could never, ever repay. Which I think is exactly Jesus' point in, in the whole story. This guy could never repay all of this. You know, he, as far as he's concerned, his, his life is finished. His life is completely over. You know, he thinks he's ruined his life. He's ruined his familial life. And then for reasons that w we don't know or understand in the story, the master comes to him and says, you're forgiven. I'm going to set you free. I'm not going to hold this debt against you. And, 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 and this is really important. We, we cannot get past this. To really understand forgiveness, we've got to understand this part of the story. When the owner forgives the debt, the debt doesn't just disappear, does it? Somebody's got to absorb it. Somebody's got to take the loss. Who takes the loss here? The owner takes the loss. The, 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 the owner in this moment absorbs 160,000 years worth of wages. It is a massive, massive debt that he forgives. Now, now, now the master in the story obviously represents God and the servant in the story represents me, represents you, it represents us. And what Jesus is saying here is that, 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 that all of us have run up this huge moral debt in the eyes of a holy God, every one of us, every single one of us. And one of the primary things we've been doing our entire lives is we have just been adding to this moral debt. You know, every time we are less than loving, every time we have a lustful thought, every time we are judgmental, every time we don't do what it is that we're meant to do, every time we gossiped, we were just adding to this mountain of moral debt before God. And what Jesus is saying is, is that God looked at you and, and God looked to, at me and, and he saw this massive debt and he is moved with compassion. And so he sends his son Jesus to die on a cross and on the cross, Jesus paid our debt. On the cross, we were set free. We were forgiven this debt, this moral debt that we owed, that we could never pay back. It was paid for us on the cross and on the cross we were set free. Now, in this story, as Jesus is telling us, everyone wants to know what's going to happen to the servant next, you know, what's happening. You know, he's been forgiven this massive debt. So what's going to happen? I mean, he, you know, he has received grace upon grace, you know, uh, that the debt has been wiped clean. So, so what is he going to do with it? H how will he live differently? And now that he's experienced this kind of grace. And so Jesus knows logically that's where the conversation is going. And so he continues with the story in verse 28. Yeah. But then when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is not much money at all. Okay, it's about a hundred days worth of wages. Now, the servant had owed the master 160,000 years worth of wages. He bumps into this guy who owes him a hundred days worth of wages. It's like pennies. How does he respond? He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And, and as we're reading this, it's like, am I reading this right? You know, how could he do this? How could he be so bonkers, basically? His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off, had the man thrown into pr prison until he could pay the debt. And it's like, how could he do this? How could he be that stupid? You know, how could he be forgiven 160,000 years worth of wages you know, to be forgiven a debt that he could never, ever repay, then immediately go out and find some guy who owes him some money and, and, and says, you know, I, I'm not going to do what my master did, you know. I, I you know, I'm going to stick with this debt, you know. I'm going to, you know, I, you know, I, he, he's not saying I'm going to absorb the debt, you know. I'm going to make the other guy pay. You know, who would do that? Well, we would actually. It, it's just 
like human nature, we want to retaliate. When somebody's hurt us, we want to hurt them back. You know, if someone pushes you, you want to push back. You know, you know it, it won't be long before the, um, the rugby season starts again, the Aviva Premiership uh, Rugby. And you know, you know that I love my rugby. And, and what happens weekend after weekend in a match is, is that you'll, you'll find one player pushes one player and, and another player pushes back. And they push back without thinking about the consequences of being sent off and jeopardizing the team's chances because 40 men against 50 men makes a difference in the end. And, and almost invariably in these moments, it's the person who pushes back, who retaliates, um, you know, who, who gets into trouble, you know. And, and that's what we do, isn't it? Someone pushes us, we want to push back. You know, you know um, someone yells at you, what do we do? We want to yell back a little bit louder. It's human nature. And I think that's what I, I want us to wrestle with today. Human nature is to retaliate. Human nature is that when someone hurts you, you want them to pay. And here's the truth, and we, we've got to realize this, that, that there's a truth about forgiveness, about authentic forgiveness, and it's that it's never cheap. W when you get hurt, and the hurt is deep and it's real. You want to, we want to hurt the other person back. You know, you, we want them to know the pain that they've inflicted on us. Now, now you react to that in, in a lot of different ways and sometimes it's actually really quite disguised. But the reality is that, 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 that you'll live your life in such a way that you'll make sure you want the other person to know, you know how it is that they've hurt you. And so you want them to pay, you want them to pay them back. I, I've been there, I've done that. I've sat around before just thinking about, dreaming about, you know, how, how, how the other person was going to hurt for what it was that they did to me. It's sort of kind of human nature. And, 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 and that's what happens when someone sort of runs up a, a moral debt with you. You, you, you know it, you're down to the last penny, as it were. You, you, you know exactly what it is that they did to you and, and when they did it. And you sort of find yourself thinking, I know that I could forgive them. But if I would have forgiven them, I know what that would mean. It would mean that I'd have to swallow the debt. You know, I, you know if, if I forgive them, it means I have to give up my right to see them hurt back. You know, it means that I have to pay the cost. I have to carry the cost. And the cost is what? It's not seeing them hurt. It, the cost is not getting even. The cost is letting go. Now, now my experience of talking with people about forgiveness is that they're actually, is that there are actually more than three obstacles to forgiveness, but I'm going to give you the three most common obstacles to forgiveness that come up for me when I'm talking one-on-one -on -one with someone about forgiveness. You know, you know and, 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 and these are individuals who say, yeah, yeah, I, I know I should forgive. I, I know there's a benefit to forgiveness, but, I, you know, and I know the hurt, the pain, the bitterness is wrecking my life. It's wrecking my relationships and making a mess uh, of my life. You know, and I want to forgive people, but I just don't know if I can. I don't know what that would look like. Th th there, there are three things that almost always come up, you know, that are like obstacles or, or are like barriers, basically. And the first one is forgiveness is not condoning. Listen, to forgive someone does not mean that you condone what it is that they did. But we, we've got to understand this. It's very important because some of us have been hurt in very real ways and in very unjust kinds of ways. And forgiveness is not just about getting to that place where you just condone that and excuse what it is that they did to you. Injustice needs to be fought at every turn, you know, and sin is not excuse, uh, sorry, so this is not excusing what they did. In other words, what you're doing when you forgive someone is you're, you're not excusing it, you're not condoning it but you're getting to a place where you say, you know, what you did was wrong. You know, we both know that what you did is inexcusable, but, but, but because Christ has forgiven me, I'm going to forgive you, but he's not condoning it. Injustice needs to be fought. Secondly, forgiveness is not reconciling. I mean, um, a lot of people, I think, get stuck on this one. But I think there's a huge difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. I, I think the reality is that 
as you go through your life, there are people that you need to forgive, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to reconcile with them. And, and, and Paul talks about this in, in Romans 12, actually, in verse 18, where he says, if possible, do everything you can to live at peace with one another. And it's very interesting that he says, if possible, because I think that means that sometimes it's not possible to live at peace with everyone. So I don't think you can always reconcile with another person, but I do think you can always forgive another person. And if I could be really honest, there are probably some people in your life that you don't need to reconcile with, that it may not be healthy for you to reconcile with them. And, and, and often what happens in certain relationships, relationships is, you know, if the other person cannot be honest about the way that they hurt you, if they cannot be honest about what it is that they've done to you, or maybe they don't even have eyes to see what it is they did to you and what it was that they did was something that was wrong. You, you, you cannot build a relationship unless there's truth, unless there's transparency, unless there's authenticity there. Because you know, if there's not truth, then there's not going to be trust. And if there's not going to be trust, then there can't be any relationship. So sometimes you forgive someone, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you reconcile with them. We've got to understand that these are two different things. I think we should we should seek reconciliation if possible, but sometimes it's not just going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And the third thing we've got to understand as an obstacle is that forgiveness is not forgetting. And I know that people can get can get hung up on this actually, that they think I, I'm going to forgive someone, which means I've got to forget what it is that happened to me. So it's like, I, I, because I can't forget, then I can't forgive. And, and, and that's not true, that there is a big difference. Forg you know, forgetting, you know, is just like this passive process that you, you hope that eventually your mind is going to forget about the stuff that happened to you in your past, that it's just going to kind of fade away. But forgiving is not a passive process. Forgiving is an active process where you make a deliberate decision that you're going to forgive someone, that you're not going to hurt them back in a way, in the way that they hurt you. And so we have to forgive precisely because we can't forget. But you've got to understand, we've got to understand there's a big difference between those two. You know, there, there, there's a little phrase um, that, 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 that I like where I say, Time doesn't heal all wounds, but God does. And for some of us, I think that we, we, we think, you know, I'm not going to make a deliberate decision to forgive. I, I, I will just over time forget. Because you think that time is going to heal those wounds in your life. But, but more than likely, it, it won't. Because time doesn't heal wounds. It just puts distance between what happened and, and where you're at now. Time doesn't heal wounds, but God does. And God will begin to heal those wounds as a result of the deliberate decision you make that you're going to forgive somebody who has hurt you. And again, to be honest, it's not an easy thing. I don't think it's easy for anybody. And there are sort of people in my life who I thought that I'd forgiven and stuff reappears in my life. It comes back up again and I have to forgive them again and again and at times again. And so I've learned that forgiveness is not so much a, a decision as it is a process. And it's really about, in the end, the state of my heart. Forgiving someone is me giving up the right to hurt you for hurting me. And instead of hurting you for hurting me. And I make the deliberate choice that I'm going to free you, even though you did hurt me. And my guess is that there are probably some of us who've been carrying around this burden for a long time. And I think my encouragement to you today would be to just put it down. Because if you don't put it down, if you don't deal with it, it is going to wreck you, it is going to ruin you. I mean, you know, I want to be honest, it costs a lot to forgive. In fact, the only thing that I think costs you more than forgiving is not forgiving. Because not forgiving is going to eventually is going to cost you your heart. You know, if you don't forgive, then you're going to be chained to your bitterness. You're going to be 
change your resentment. You're going to be change your anger. If you don't forgive, then what joy you have in your life is slowly going to be choked out of you. It's going to dissipate. If you don't forgive, then the bitterness inside of you is eventually going to crowd out any kindness and compassion that you have left inside of you. And I believe, and I think this is the key, because some of you have tried this in your own life. You've tried to forgive in your own power. And maybe maybe I'm not that good a person, but, but I do not think as human beings that we have the power to sometimes forgive people in the way that they need to be forgiven. I, I don't know that that's in us, which is why I think this verse in Ephesians 4 is so important where Paul says, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And how does he say, say this happens? He goes on, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And essentially, what he's saying here is, uh, this is not something you have, have the power to do on your own. You, 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 you don't have the power to offer this. And the only way you can offer this is because you first received it. This isn't about you having this unbelievable grace inside of you, that you and grace inside of you that you're going to be able to offer other people. It's about the fact that you've received this grace from Jesus. Uh, 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 and that he has erased this massive debt that you've had and therefore you have something to often offer and the question just like in this par parable that Jesus told is how do we respond to that in, in essence you've had we've had 160,000 years worth of wages this moral debt completely erased uh, and the question is what do you want to do with the second half of your life what does that look like in the light of that? You know, how many of us, when we go on a journey on a plane, you know, engage with the safety procedures we have to go through? I used to fly quite a lot, um, if I'm honest, and, and um, I used to engage with, with these procedures, and they always used to talk about the oxygen masks coming down, you know, how they drop down, and, you know, and I've never actually seen that happen. I've seen it on movies. You know, I never want to be on a plane when it actually happens. Um, but I did used to fly a lot, as I've said, and, and because of that, I used to pay attention to the safety instructions. Uh, and, 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 and I always used to wonder when we were going through this, what it might be like to put it into practice. Um, and, and, you know, you know, what they'll tell you at some point in this process is that if the cabin pressure were to drop, that this little bag would drop down, this oxygen mask would drop down, and, and you have to put it on and you have to breathe normally. And my guess is, as I think about that, as you think about that, is I would not be breathing normally. You know, I, I would be breathing in deeply, imagining that it was probably going to be my last breath or last few breaths. Um, but and so I used to try making sure. I used to practice breathing normally in case it did happen and what sort of rhythm I'd get into. But, but the most in, interesting thing about the safety instructions regarding the oxygen masks was they would say, if you're traveling with a child or somebody who's acting like a child, uh, you need to secure your own oxygen mask first before you can help other people. Now, if you're traveling with more than two children, you've probably got to work out um, which child is your favorite um, and the order in which you're going to put the masks on. But I, I, I remember, think, I used to think, surely it must be the most selfish thing in the world as a parent or as a friend um, to put your mask on first. And it just sort of goes against every instinct that you naturally have, you know, that you would secure your own oxygen, oxygen mask first, you know. And then you'd go about helping people around you. It just seemed sort of back to front to me. But then obviously the explanation behind that is, if you're not getting oxygen yourself, then you're going to pass out. And if you pass out, then you're going to be no good to the people around you. So you have to secure your oxygen mask first. And then you can help out your children. Then you can help out the people that are around you. Then, Because then you've got oxygen, then you can breathe. And the whole concept behind that is you cannot exa exhale what you have not inhaled. You've got to inhale that air before you can exhale the air. And I think that's exactly what the Bible is talking about in this passage, in this idea of forgiveness. Until you learn to inhale the grace of God and all the goodness that comes along with that, you can never expect to exhale that kind of grace. And along with inhaling that grace, there's a responsibility too. Because by the nature of inhaling the goodness, goodness of God and his graciousness, by, na by, 
by nature, the natural thing to do is, is to just breathe out, is to just exhale. And I think that what Paul was saying in this passage is that the only thing that gives us fallen, messed up people the power to extend grace to anyone else is the experience that we have been forgiven ourselves by Holy God. This is a choice that we have to make. And, and, and I want to be honest with you and, and tell you, and you probably discovered this yourselves, that when you forgive someone, it doesn't erase all the hurt from the past. But when you forgive someone, what it does is it erases the power that the hurt has. When you forgive someone, what it does is allows the past to become just that. It is the past. And the reason I think perhaps for some of us this is a really holy moment um, is that we have the ability to say this is not how my story is going to end. I'm not going to continue to go through life and allowing pain and bitterness and hurt from my past to contaminate everything else in my life. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to inhale the grace of God and then I'm going to extend that to someone else, whether they deserve it or not. But until I do that, I'm not going to experience the freedom that God has for me out of his grace and his love. And I'm telling you, we are never so free as when we reach back into our past and we forgive someone who has caused us pain. Inhale grace, breathe it back out again. Choose to bless somebody else instead of cursing yourself. Let's pray, shall we? Well, I recognise that this is an incredibly challenging um, topic, theme uh, for all of us in some way or another. And for many of us, it will raise all sorts of issues or people or memories or contexts, Lord, that perhaps we'd not even expected today, but in this series, Lord, where we're pursuing freedom and the call of freedom, the call that you have for us to step into the fullness of life. Lord, I want to pray that you would perhaps bring to mind in these moments through your spirit any areas of unforgiveness that, uh, you know, stand in the way of us entering into the fullness of life that you have for us. And I want to pray your grace over us. I want to pray your blessing over us. I want to, you to highlight any moments, any people, any areas that you want us to acknowledge before you and bring to you and where you want to help us let go and to free people and to forgive people in this moment. But we know that we can only do that if we are aware of your grace offered to us, Lord. So in this moment again, Lord, we want to thank you for your grace. We want to thank you for your goodness. We want to thank you for your love. We want to thank you for the cross. We thank you, want to thank you for the freedom that you have achieved for all of us on the cross. And I ask that you would fill us with your grace and with your love that we could breathe in, that we could inhale all that is good, all that is lovely, all that is true. And even as we receive and as we're reminded of what it is that we've received from you, the forgiveness and the freedom and the love and the life that you have for us, Lord, that you would give us the grace to forgive others. Not in any way does that mean condoning what they did or excusing what they did, or even ha having to reconcile with others. But Lord, that you would help us to free those people, to forgive those people, forgive those moments from our past, so we could step into the fullness of life as you have it for us in this moment. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. 
Even if we can't forget, Lord, we know that we can forgive. And we know that you are the one that heals, not time, but you. And we ask you to come and bring your healing to us, your restoration to us, your peace to us and your grace to us. And that we, in so many ways, as we've been wounded, as we're touched by you, would become wounded healers ourselves as we reflect you and as we carry you. And as we go out into this uh, week that lies ahead of us, Lord, I want to pray that you would bless us, that you would watch over us, that you would make your face to shine upon us, that you would give us your peace, that you would give us your grace and your blessing. The blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us, both today and forevermore. Amen.